How many of you guys know who NPR is? Okay. I always have to check. I, when, I, when people in Ukraine, when I say I work for NPR, a lot of people sometimes will give me like this kind of, meh. Uh, and I just say it's like the American BBC, um, which makes us sound much more distinguished. But um, uh, yeah, so I, uh, my name's Nate or Nathan. It's very nice to meet you all, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, I work for NPR. Um, and NPR, since the beginning of, well, even prior to February 24th, had teams in Ukraine that were covering uh, kind of the buildup along the border and everything. We had people there in 2014 after they annexed Crimea and all that. So, um, but after the conflict started, they started, they really beefed up their presence. We had four correspondents uh, rotating through the country for the first like five months of the conflict. Um, now it's reduced to two. So there's only two of us in the country at a time. Uh, I just came out from a month long stint there and, um, and would really like to go back because I've totally fell in love with Ukraine. It's an incredible place. Um, so I know it sounds dumb because we're all journalists and uh, every story we tell is a human story, hopefully. Um, but I wanted to talk about it because I think that uh, especially my experience, and I should say my experience is not huge, it's not, I don't live in Ukraine, I haven't been reporting on conflict for a super long time, um, but, you know, when you're trying to talk to people and make this relatable to people in the United States, I think finding human stories is the only way you can really get something to stick. Um, so, this first photo I wanted to show is kind of an example of this. It's a story that hasn't published yet, but we hung out uh, with a woman who lives in Izum in far kind of northeastern Ukraine. Her apartment was damaged, uh, and she's planning to spend the entire winter there, even though she doesn't have windows, even though she doesn't have gas, even though the electricity kind of comes and goes. Um, and so that's going to be a story about basically Russia's attempts to weaponize the Ukrainian winter and break people's will to support the fight. Um, but. The reason I wanted to show this picture is because this is how, maybe to a fault, I try to approach reporting. I want to get to know people. I want to show them that there's somebody they can, you know, that I'm somebody they can trust, that somebody they can talk to. I try to make relationships with people. Uh, so if you go to the next, let me see if this works. All right. This is most of the reporting that we end up seeing in Ukraine, right? This is from the Kherson region a couple weeks ago. So we had embedded with a military unit, um, and as they were kind of doing one of these hit-and-run strikes, which has become very, very common in the conflict, it's a story that still hasn't published yet either about basically how winter is going to change battlefield tactics for both sides, um, because a lot of what's happening right now is kind of hide-and-seek, where basically you hide in the cover of foliage and fire missiles and then run away, and that's going to be a lot harder to do when winter hits. This is from the Chernihi region uh, during my first rotation there in late March. And the reason I wanted to show these two things because I feel like a lot of what the foreign audience to what's happening in Ukraine gets is this, right? It's a lot of, like, destruction, you know, artillery firing, terrible stuff, stuff that is occurring that I think is really important to show. Uh, but to the point that you were kind of making earlier about, you know, we're almost nine months into this conflict. I do think that foreign interest, you know, like I'm running into this right now. I've mentioned three stories that I've done that still haven't published because the U.S. midterms happened earlier this week and it was hard to get anything on. Um, so a big thing that I try doing is finding ways that an American audience can relate to what's happening there. So what you don't see as much of is this, hanging out, eating food with people, getting to know people. I wish I could play some of the audio, but there was an audio issue. But um, basically, getting to sit down and have dinner with this incredible 71-year-old woman who's staying in her home. Uh, this is in Bill Hironostrovsky. We went to like a community barbecue after they had been cleaning up rubble from a missile strike the day before. This is in Tuesday Lagoons National Park. <laughs> this is uh, a f the blonde woman you see there is a photographer I work with a lot in Ukraine. This is Elena Lysenko, one of our uh, translators who is with us. 
And this was a story we did about basically environmental damage that's been caused uh, by, by Ukraine's war, or by Russia's war. So um, I just wanted to talk through some of the stories that I've tried doing. Basically, when I first got to Ukraine, I had no idea how to cover conflict. Uh, I, you know, have reported on U.S. elections. I've reported on tons of natural disasters, which can feel like a conflict zone, but it's very different. Um, and I was totally struggling. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to not come across like a total idiot, which is a big problem for me. Um, and so what I really tried to do was find stories that I thought had kind of strings or connections to stuff that was happening in the U.S. Because um, a person told me this a long time ago, and it's something I always think about as a journalist, is there's so much content right now that it's really hard to get somebody to pay attention. And so you always have to find something that's sticky. You just want something, one piece of a story that's going to stick with somebody for a little while longer. So a week later, they're having a conversation with a friend, and boom, they think back to your story. So this was a story we did in Bessarabia, basically looking at whether the Danube River was going to be a you know, potential trade conduit that would you know, offset some of the losses that Ukraine was looking at with the Black Sea blockade. This was before the grain deal was negotiated. Um, but we drank homemade moonshine and hung out and ate fish that were caught on the Danube River with this guy. And we were able to play a bunch of audio of that from the story which I think, you know, I had people reach out to me afterwards and say, like, oh, my God, how'd the fish taste, you know? And it, was, it wasn't that good. But <laughs> we, uh, we did that story because I thought, hey, this is something that I think will resonate with people. We're going to talk to a trucker who's stuck and can't get anything out. So we spend two minutes of a seven-minute story with a trucker uh, hanging out. We went to a coal mine in eastern Ukraine um, to basically look at how Russia is essentially taking a bunch of natural resources from Ukraine and, you know, not only for its effort to try to weaponize the winter, but also to kind of ruin the country's economy. The thing that I thought was really interesting about this story is Ukraine's coal industry was on a similar trajectory to the U.S. coal industry, which is, it's in decline. And there was, a lot of these communities were in just, uh, we're negotiating just transitions, where basically they're looking to move from fossil fuels to a different type of fuel source. That's off the table right now. Right now, coal miners in Ukraine feel like they are the heroes of the day, and they're being treated as such. And I thought, wow, that'd be a really interesting thing. Maybe some guy in West Virginia who's listening to NPR is going to hear that and relate to the war in a new way. I usually cover climate change and the environment. so. I was interested in doing a story about the environmental impact of the war. We went to a couple of different places. This is a place where a jet crashed outside of Zhytomyr in northwest Ukraine, started a wildfire. Um, that story, I was telling Boriana last night, got way more feedback than any of the other stories I did talking to people who were searching through the rubble of their damaged home. And I, I don't know what to make of that, but I think that sometimes these sorts of stories that are a little off the news of the day really really resonate with people. And this is a story we did on my last rotation where we basically looked at how the social welfare system in Ukraine is trying to handle all of the people that have been displaced and who have lost jobs. Yeah, and then I just wanted to show, so this is, uh, we went and visited some frontline positions northeast of Kharkiv where they're basically digging in and trying to prepare for the upcoming winter. Um, this is one thing that I don't know, I mean, you guys are all from this part of the world, so forgive me if it's just shocking to me, but everywhere we went, everyone we would talk to, they were like, oh, drink our coffee, have this treat. Like, this place, they had an entire table full of grapes and pears that locals had brought them, and they filled a bag up for us. And I'm like, I'm not living in a trench. I don't know that I need these grapes and pears. Uh, but just the generosity and the, you know, welcoming nature of Ukraine has been utterly, yeah, it's blown me over. It's really incredible. And it leads to a lot of conversations like this. I don't know if this will play. Now oh, you can't hear it. So this is a, an electrician. We visited a, we spent a day with an electrician who's been fixing damaged substations uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and of course, he wanted to have us drink his homemade moonshine with him at like noon. Um, and 
But this is a video of him explaining the meaning of life to me, uh, which it's quite simple, actually. Life is simple. That's all it is. Um, but uh, this is kind of another example of just like, I, you know, we have the ability at NPR that we're not, we're not trying to every day publish something. It's very different than some of what we heard earlier. And so we have the time to spend with people and get to know them and kind of, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to spend that time and be able to do this. And then, yeah, the last thing I just wanted to point out uh, is I'm just a dude from America who comes in for a month at a time, talks to people, gets to meet incredible people, but then I leave. That's not the case for a lot of our folks. Um, so Sirhi Yesen Jr. is a guy that drives for us every time I'm in Ukraine, and he is the man. I love that man. Like, I, he's, it's his birthday today, and I've already sent him probably 48 videos. Uh, Anya Palomarenko has been our fixer for a lot of it. And I just think, you know, one of the things that I, I try to say everywhere I go and I try to communicate to people back home when I'm talking to them is it's, you know, it, for the folks that are in Ukraine, it's a much different experience than what I'm experiencing, and I, I know that. Um, and so when I come up here and I say, like, I've had an incredible time in Ukraine, because I have had an incredible time in Ukraine meeting incredible people, I understand that that's not the case for a lot of people. Um, and it's a hard thing to reconcile, uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I could wax poetic about it, but I think I'd rather hear if you guys have any questions. Hi, I'm Olya Lepinska from Ukraine. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you came to Ukraine having uh, no experience in covering conflicts. So um, I wonder, mm, why, why did you go to Ukraine? Was it your interest? Were you the only one available in, in uh, uh, um, NPR to, to be sent to Ukraine or, or why? Uh, yeah, so a couple of reasons. I have a sister-in-law who's Ukrainian, who's from Dnipro, um, and and so I was familiar with Ukraine through that um, and was interested for that reason. I also, it, it, it's purely voluntary. NPR, they can't tell somebody to go to a war zone. Um, but and I, it, there, was a, there was a number of people that volunteered to go because they thought it was an important story and an interesting story. And um, so that's, that's what it was. I volunteered um, and continue to volunteer. I, frankly, I keep begging them to let me go back. So. Because we've discussed uh, with the previous speakers interest of Western readership and Western audience in what's happening in Ukraine, what's your impression about without you asking to without me asking you to share corporate data? What's your <laughs> impression about how the, the audience is growing or, or or dropping or what's happening to the interest of your audience in the Ukrainian conflict? First, I would say if I had the corporate data, I'd be happy to share it with you. Uh, but uh, no, I mean I think. From my understanding, interest, like NPR audience's interest in Ukraine has remained extremely high, much higher than a lot of other stories. Um, we have seen a drop off in the last couple of months, especially because I think, you know, there's there's been these sort of like chapters of the conflict where there's a lot of news and then there's just kind of these lulls. And I think right now we're entering like with the news yesterday around Kherson, like we're, it's, there's going to be a lot more news about it for a little while and probably a lot more interest. Um, I don't know how long that can be sustained, if I'm being totally honest. I mean, I think I'm frankly a little surprised it's still as high as it is just because of the midterm elections and because of, you know, I, I, I cover a lot of natural disasters in the U.S. and my impression was that like there's going to be a terrible wildfire season, there's going to be a huge hurricane, American interest is going to drop off. We had the huge hurricane, we didn't have the huge wildfire, and but still interest stayed high. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think it's it's still pretty high, and I think it will continue to be. Um, and I think it's important that we keep telling these stories because I mean, the U.S. has made a huge financial commitment to Ukraine um, throughout this entire conflict, and I think that's an important thing for us to keep reporting on too. Thank you. I'm just curious, in a month, how many stories 
could you produce? And when you volunteered to go to Ukraine, did you get uh, some special training from your media or how did your media prepare you for a, a war zone? Yeah, so first, the second question, we, to cover any conflict, we have to do like a hostile environment training, which is just like a three day training. Um, and we have to do it every three, every two years. So mine has definitely lapsed, but it's okay. I would recommend if anybody's doing reporting there, you should definitely try to get hostile environment training because, you know, it's just having the medical skills to know how to do some of that stuff is extremely important. Um, and it just makes you feel more comfortable going into, you know, hotter areas. Uh, in terms of stories, it's, so NPR, we, we're a multifaceted beast. Uh, we have our, what we call our newscasts, which are just like one minute long little news spots. And usually I'll do two or three of those a day. Um, and then we'll have our website where you're going to maybe do like a 400, 500 word quick, here's the news story. And maybe you do two of those a week. Um, we do our show two ways, which is where you talk to a host and you try to sound like you know what you're saying. Uh, usually you'll do a couple of those a week. And then I try to do, usually with a month long rotation, I'll try to do five or six kind of longer reported features um, on a specific topic.